Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. Apologies have been received today um, from Tavish Scott, MSP. Our first item of business is an evidence session as part of the committee's inquiry into arts funding. Uh, we will take evidence from two panels of witnesses and I would like to welcome our first panel, which comprises Rona Alexander, Vice Chair of Voluntary Arts Scotland, and Jeannie Nicholl, uh, who is a visual artist who is also past president of the Scottish Artists' Union. And Jeannie has co-led some research on in-kind work in the contemporary arts sector. Um, so thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. Uh, maybe I could start off by asking Jeannie to... Um, uh, to maybe talk through the research and, and what it found? Um, so basically, um, uh, the project that I did was with uh, art fellow artist Ailey Rutherford, and um, it came out of discussions between myself and Ailey, uh, coming from previous experiences of taking part in a variety of art festivals, all of which had a common theme, and that was the difficulty in getting paid. Um, and the willingness of artists to self-exploit in a way in order to take part. So um, basically In Kind was a research project that we, the two of us undertook um, as part of GI um, in 2018 last year. Which, so that's Glasgow International Festival of the Visual Arts, which is a very large visual arts festival based in Glasgow, obviously. And our project aimed to map the hidden economies of uh, the visual arts and the below the waterline economy. So charting the unseen and the unaccounted for efforts that enable um, so much of the arts to take place. So exploring unpaid labor, m uh, mutual support favors and volunteer hours. Um, and I suppose it's relating to basically a sort of feminist um, notion of the economy. Um, anyway, so, um, we took part in the across the city strand of GI, so GI has different strands, um, some of which is like curated and funded, some of it is funded by um, arts organisations themselves, but we were in the part that was completely unfunded, so it's actually the largest part of GI, um, the largest section, um, so it, basically artists are encouraged to find and use new and unusual spaces across the whole of the city. So there, uh, there's 90 exhibitions and 78 venues. Um, and basically, the, the sort of total funding um, for GI, they give out one £3,000 bursary. Or this is in 2018 anyway. But the total funding um, was really about, I worked out, 114000 total funding across 90 exhibitions and 78 venues. But actually, the vast majority of the artists taking part are self-funding. So our project um, was asking artists to log their out-of-pocket expenses and unpaid hours that they were basically contributing to, to take part in GI. Um, and we, we uh, basically created a mobile information unit and um, worked with statistics that we, we set up our own website so artists could basically log their hours and their out-of-pocket expenses. Um, and this was uh, displayed as a data visualization that basically updated in real time during, well, throughout the whole of the three week festival. So the point of it was basically to highlight the, the issues, the precarious nature and the unsustainableness of the, the huge amount of, you know, um, I suppose I've used the word self-exploitation already, but the, the contribution that artists were basically having to make in order to take part in GI. And you can see more about, about our project. Um, we've got a website, it's at www.inkindproject.info, and we've got the data visualisation on that and stats. And we, we've done subsequent um, events. So at the Barbican in London, um, our project coincided with that report that was called Panic. And it was published by uh, sociologists and statisticians from the University of Edinburgh and Sheffield. Um, and um, basically, it's the, the title of the report is Panic, Social Class Tastes and Inequalities in the Creative Industries. Um, and so it's basically looking at the way that, you know, the arts are basically a, a meritocracy, I suppose you could say. 
Um, and yeah, we, we were asked to create to um, take part in workshops at the Barbican as, as a result, and we, we've created a list of demands through other workshop events, um, follow-up work, workshops at Kenning Park Project, and we gave a presentation at Cross Party Group on Culture here, um, basically just to illustrate our project. But yeah, you can find out more about it online if you'd like to. Yeah, thanks. It was just to get that on the record here. <laughs> um, <laughs> So this um, this is something that we've discovered through the our written submissions and uh, and through some of the other evidence sessions that we've taken is the amount of work in the arts sector um, that's that's unpaid or which um, which doesn't uh, which doesn't attract fair pay. Um, Rona, uh, what is the extent of the this problem? Do you think? Um, well. I'm here to represent Voluntary Arts Scotland, which is the national development agency for, um, it's the other side of the coin, I suppose. It's a national development agency for those who um, take part in arts and culture in their, in their free time. So it's from um, painting, painting groups um, to uh, sc sc sculpture dance, country dancing and so on. So um, that, our, our evidence is less about fair fair pay for artists. Yeah. We, we and we work with our, with voluntary groups. We would certainly encourage them to um, pay fairly on on the rates when working with professional artists. But I, I guess the other, why we are together is we're both the, the, the yeah. parts of the sector that are a little bit under the radar and, and below mm -hmm. the waterline in terms of funding funding decisions. So I don't know if you want yeah, to say I mean, more about it, the yeah, scale of the problem. Yeah, w with my other hat on, which is um, as a, a executive member of the Scottish Artists' Union, um, basically since 2012, um, SAU has conducted a membership survey. So we've, we've amassed a whole load of stats and information about how artists operate and how they, they support themselves. So. SEU basically represents professional working artists in Scotland. We've got a membership of over 1,300 professional artists. So we, we've, we've amassed all these statistics. So we, we know that um, basically over 50% of our membership, there was, there was a question recently about volunteering in, the, volunteering in the arts. And so we found out that over 50% of the membership of SEU that filled in the, the survey basically are, are taking part in volunteering you know, within the art. So it's kind of endemic, you know, it's almost like a, a way of operating. So th this goes along with the fact that, you know, uh, uh, it's been consistently about 80% of our membership is self-employed. So obviously self-employed, um, the way people work when they're self-employed means that they're not supported, you know, um, as far as holiday pay, maternity pay, all the kind of rights that come when you have salary are just not really an issue. So, um, yeah, that, that it's kind of that's one of the, another kind of factor within within the, the arts, obviously. Um. In, in terms of our written submissions, uh, some of the some of the written submissions that we've had uh, looked at ways to address this issue. And, uh, some of the suggestions were your requirement for funded organisations to dedicate at least 50% of their annual budget to, to artists, because this, obviously at the RFO row there was quite a lot of concern that a lot of the money was not going to artists, but it was going to organisations that were administration uh, focused or management focused. Um, other suggestions are that organisations that don't pay union rates shouldn't actually get funding at all. Um, what's your view on some of these solutions? I mean, it's, it's kind of taken uh, SEU quite a, a number of years to get Creative Scotland to kind of embed our recommended rates of pay within their um, funding structure. So now they do recommend that um, if artists or organisations put in for funding, then they do need to show evidence that they're using um, SEUs or other equity um, musicians union, other arts unions uh, rates of pay. So I think we, we you know, we ha that has sort of um, helped the situation. Um, but I think I think one of the issues is that actually getting funding is incredibly competitive. Uh, one of our demands is about you know trying to make the arts less about competition. So ar artists are basically competing. So. Individual artists can only apply to the open fund through Creative Scotland, and it basically it's one large pot of money across all art forms, 
uh, aimed at individuals as well as organisations. And I think we, we find that really low rates of our members, like 60% of our membership have never received public funding. And over and over again, we hear that um, our members find it really intimidating. I mean, we've got ridiculously high levels of dyslexia within <laughs> within the visual arts. Uh, you know, at, at Glasgow School of Arts, we've got an, uh, you know, a, an entire department um, related to dyslexia, I think. But, uh, you know, the, 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 even just filling in the forms, I think people find quite intimidating. The budgets, adding percentages, the, the whole kind of, you know, um, it, it, it feels, to, even to myself, who, who I've got 25 years of experience as an artist, I graduated in 1989, uh, the thought of doing a Creative, funding, uh, Creative Scotland funding application is probably at least three weeks' work, you know. Um, and it's intimidating, and I've got all that experience, so I hate to think what recent graduates feel like, you know, coming out of art schools with that kind of uphill struggle to... To tackle, so yeah, I think it's it's really quite an issue. Another issue, I mean, I could talk all day about this, but another issue that um, SEU have realised is that over sixty percent of our membership are over the age of fifty, which kind of begs the question, you know, are where are all the young artists? You know, are they are they disappearing down off down south? Are they not? Um, seeing a union as a sort of relevant thing for them. We provide uh, public liability insurance as one of our membership benefits. So, you know, we, we are providing, you know, it's, it's advantageous for artists to join if they're working in, in the sector, obviously. Um, so, yeah, th I think we've got, we are worried about the fact that, that it seems to us that there's so few, although there's high numbers of, of students actually going through the art schools, in reality, the ones that aren't ending up working in call centres or, you know, working in bars uh, <laughs> who are actually t get, you know, able to and take on work in what is an incredibly competitive sector. Um, yeah, it's, that's, it's a major issue, I think. And it, and it bodes badly for the future. Um, yeah, I could go on. I mean, I, th I, th I could, you know, Creative Scotland I could, you know, they do um, local authority funded in certain cities. They've got sort of small pots of money, like £2,000 grants. But, you know, th th again, these, these kind of funded things are not um, in any way, they might um, facilitate projects, but they're in no way, in, you know, enabling people to actually survive, um, you know, financially. Thanks. We've got a supplementary from Stuart McMillan. Thank you, convener. Um, Jenny, you just mentioned a moment ago uh, regarding dyslexia. Uh, I'm uh, one of the deputy conveners of the Cross Party Group on dyslexia. Uh, and do you have any any percentages or have you any indication as to kind of what the the figures actually are for people? I'm afraid I don't actually have those kind of fing figures um, at my fingertips. It's not really something that we've actually questioned people. I think particularly in our membership survey, but yeah, it's something that we probably should. But I do know that, you know, just um, anecdotally, extremely high levels. I mean, it's almost like a natural um, place for people, creative people tend to, you know, but people with dyslexia often levitate towards, and my, my, my partner is dyslexic and he's a cabinet maker. One of my daughters is dyslexic, she's extremely creative. You know, I think um, dyslexia and creativity almost um, go hand in hand. So yeah, I think that that idea of form filling and uh, applying for funding is is yeah additionally tricky when you're dyslexic, as you are probably well aware. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, so for me, looking at this inquiry, there's two things. One is the question on how the current pot of money is spent, and I suppose that's where we look at things like uh, who the individual artists versus organisations, but also how do we increase the size of the pot? Is that really what the issue is here? How do we get more money in? And to ask a question about the voluntary arts sector, I suppose it's to ask, um, Rona, how important do you think that is when the, the government have, a, and all the parties sign up to it, a policy of increasing wellbeing in Scotland, investment into health, investment into education. Voluntary arts is an area that traditionally is very underfunded and exists on a shoestring. But do you see the benefits that you as an organisation have to those other policy areas? And do you see any... Do you see any moves towards those policy areas making a contribution to arts or any co, is there examples of co-working? Um, I, 
Um, it's, it's hu we think that it's hugely beneficial to the broader well-being agenda and to social connectedness, I suppose, as both there's the product of art, isn't there, but there's also the process of taking part in mm -hmm. make, being a maker and particularly working in groups that, that can give so, so um, much benefit in terms of, of well-being and, and connectedness. And it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult landscape and got increasingly difficult, I think, because of the, um, the less local authority funding to to um, small grants, the micro grants, the, um, mm. that 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 the voluntary and amateur groups would need maybe to continue their work or to do work in areas with less social or economic capital or to work with an artist to maybe improve their reach and their participation. So it's uh, it's an extremely difficult landscape. And just the points that jenny has been making about the proportionality, I suppose, of applying applying for funding is, is equally the case for voluntary and amateur, <coughs> amateur groups. They will very rarely, if ever, access open the open fund from from Creative Scotland because of, of the work that it takes and, and the demands that it makes. So the kind of schemes that our met, our the people who are part of our network uh, really appreciate are Awards for All, which is, is small project funding or micro grant schemes. We've been able to offer those um, in, in some in some cases, which just help with hospitality and with um, events costs and there's also a really good example I would say um, of Creative Fund, uh, Scotland funding to this year's Refugee Festival to allow um, refugee and asylum seeking groups to put on events right across Scotland because of course many local authorities are um, hosting refugees for the for the first time with the with the Syrian intake and that's that's something that's a, a really positive um, development I, I would say. And you mentioned local authorities and the awards for all. Are you aware of any conversations that are happening with other bodies, whether it's NHS or any other statutory bodies, or does the private sector make any contribution to your area of work? Or? It's very difficult to get private sector contribution, both to us as a network organisation, because most... Um, corporate funders prefer to fund direct outcomes with direct beneficiaries that they can see and put a label label on. So a network organisation like ourselves um, won't uh, uh, struggle to access that funding. And, and yes, at a local level, people will get support from local businesses, but it's not at that, trans that, that transformative level, I suppose. And the NHS, yes, again, things will happen, good things will happen in some areas, but it's not a universal picture. I don't know if that's what you would say. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I've had re at residencies um, working in care homes and things like that. So, But again, they're all very kind of random and kind of sporadic. Um, that The work I did was for Aberdeenshire Council. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of, um, I suppose, different arts organisations doing... Um, like um, another hat I've got is I'm a, a trustee for Engage, which is the national organisation for gallery education, and they do a lot of work, um, very kind of diverse. So you know, different um, galleries doing outreach projects, um, and yeah, that all has a, a sort of impact in trying to bring um, people from more diverse backgrounds into the arts. But I think things like um, local authority cuts have obviously really affected artists in general I think you know as a as a source of income I mean previously the under labor uh, there was the cultural cultural coordinators and I think the there, there's um people look back and that that um thinking that was actually a really good kind of conduit you know between artists and schools because artists aren't necessarily very good brokers for themselves mm -hmm. uh, they're not necessarily very good negotiators which i think you know is why pay is always an issue and um, no matter what sort of level of you know um, status you might be in careers artists always find it difficult to no negotiate even if they're at a you know high level of su success so yeah i think um the cultural cultural coordinators were a really good kind of route or conduit for uh, local authorities and for all the kind of work that was going on in, in kind of local authority areas. But yeah, I think cuts to arts budgets, you know, it's always very easy. 
well, it seems to be relatively easy to cut arts budgets rather than, you know, the cliche of funding a hospital. But I think, you know, there's lots of our organisations that do see that link between, you know, artistic well-being, um, artist, artistic um, activity and general well-being. You know, it's kind of in the ether. But, um, so the government are currently working on the cultural strategy and there's been a number of drafts and consultation events. Do you think the cultural strategy is going to address some of these issues, whether it's... Because um, what you're kind of describing is a fairly piecemeal situation, a lack of strategic direction, whether that's a national level or a local government level. That seems quite varied as to how different local authorities approach culture. Do you think the strategy will help to address any of this? Or? I think, think so. I mean, I, th I would think that they've, they've, you know, they've been doing enough research and that it seems to have been going on for years, the kind of cultural strategy stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it will help. Um, you know, yeah. Yes, I'd, like I'd, hope, I'd hope so. Um, uh, and I hope that it, it goes some way to recognise the issues that are below, below the radar at, at the moment, the areas that perhaps have, less, have had less voice in, in, in the past than the, than the big institutions, because I think that there could be a redressing of the, of the balancing. Just as you're yeah. talk, talking about cultural coordinators, I think, yes, it is the, it's the lack of any uniform infrastructure yeah. at a local level I mean, I mean, to support, yeah. to highlight, um, re refer on to opportunities and network and so yeah. on that is a real... I mean, I think, it's, I think it, it keeps coming up in my head anyway, what, you know, if, if the arts were ring-fenced, you know, um, you know, Murray Council cut its entire budget, it was only 60,000, it was only one arts administrator and, and an assistant, you know, it's probably the size of a... The, you know, the, you could buy a Land Rover for that, and how many Land Rovers are driving around Mori? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, th these budgets aren't necessarily large, but they can be very significant and they can have a far-reaching effect. Um, you know, I suppose that there's that thing of, you know, artists are, are, you know, initiate a lot of projects and bring in other funding and, yeah, are, you know, innovative. Mm -hmm. Catalyst. Yeah, catalyst for other things happening. So um, I would say that, you know, employing artists or engaging with artists is money well spent. And finally, um, Janie at the beginning talked about diversity. I don't know if you want to say any more about what the current financial landscape, what impact that's having on diversity. We've heard some comments from other witnesses about uh, BME representation, about older artists, about you've talked about women's involvement in art and the challenges that are. Do the, how... How much an impact is the current financial landscape having on well, this agenda? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely having an impact because, I mean, who can afford to be an artist? You know, for, for GI, that was artists had to sign up to work for three weeks uh, to man their exhibitions for three weeks. And that's not, that's not including all the work that goes in, you know, prior to even putting on an exhibition or to set up an exhibition. You know, you're, you're talking about a lot of work. And, uh, you know, it... I suppose I, I just think it's not sustainable, you know, and, and artists, that's where they struggle is to sustain careers. Lots of artists end up dropping out if they have family commitments or, you know, uh, yeah, it, mean, it means living in this kind of precarious situation. I mean, we've got the statistics to prove that, um, you know, high, high percentages probably about over 60% or 70% of our membership are earning, you know, less than... Um, 20 grand a year or, you know, way below what is considered to be, a, a, you know, the, the average income or earnings or, you know, they're basically low, low earning, low, on low pay um, due to being self-employed and the difficulties in, in getting paid and sustaining these kind of careers. But, you know, you do think, well, actually, they are contributing a lot to um, the overall culture of of Scotland and, you know, internationally, the reputation of of artists. But again, yet again, um, generally, it, you know, it, sh it shouldn't just be people from, um, from privileged backgrounds that get these opportunities, but more and more it seems to be that that's, that's how it, 
it's panning out, you know. And I would say it was the same picture in the community sector, obviously, if you're in an um, area of economic prosperity with a lot of social capital, you can perhaps uh, continue to be involved in, in the arts without, mm. without funding. But where funding is really vital is in our more disadvantaged communities or where there isn't, uh, and to bring in arts expertise, perhaps, to increase audience and in increase the, the quality of, of the work and, and engage more people and if that's missing then it, it's getting a more and more unequal playing field and as as voluntary arts one of the key things we try and do is support diversity in the art and through our epic awards to highlight exam really good examples of where that's happening in different in different communities and in different parts of the country thank you Ross Green. thank you convener um, the proposal for a universal basic income in Scotland has moved on quite a bit in the last few years. There's four local authorities that have now agreed to trial it. Some of the written evidence that we've received for this inquiry proposes that a UBI would be beneficial to artists in Scotland. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how that might work and how it might change the landscape, particularly for um, individual artists who are not part of wider organisations or networks. Yeah, I mean, um, we at um, Scottish Arts Union, um, our AGM last year, we had, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but from, from RA, RSA came and gave a presentation about universal basic income. And, you know, it does look like it could be a way of supporting people to actually have creative, you know, lives um, while being supported. And I suppose another thing we've noticed with our membership survey, which I keep going back to, but, um, you know, the, this fact that a lot of artists um, are in this kind of older age bracket, it, it seems to us that there's this evidence of people actually putting off creative careers until they retire or taking early retirement uh, in order to then, um, you know, um, be in a sort of stable enough position to, to actually take on you know, creative professions, but, you know, do we want all our artists to be, you know, at that spectrum of the, you know, age group? And again, this affects the sort of, um, the diversity of the age, age span of the arts. So yeah, I think freeing up the universal basic income, because basically the, the old age pension is a, a universal basic income, you know, it's non-means tested, you know, no questions asked um, income. Uh, so we do already have universal basic income, but we just don't give it to younger people. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it would it would be, and an SEU would be really interested in, you know, if that was rolled out within different areas of Scotland, yeah. Um, the social security system as it currently exists is something that came up in our roundtable discussion with artists last week. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on artists' experience with the, the current system. There was a suggestion last week that in the past some folk have continued to, to do their art while I, the phrase it was used was while on the while on the dole. Um, but the system, as it has changed over recent years to become a more hostile one, has, has even made that essentially impossible. Is that something that the Artists' Union in particular has, has noticed? Is it something that you've seen in, in your networks? That yeah, I mean, I think just generally, I mean, the, the, I suppose the benefit system has, has become so sort of vilified and problematic and difficult that, you, you know, you imagine people avoid it like the plague in a way, but... Um, in the past, uh, you know, I, I know lots of artists who maybe did start off their careers um, claiming, you know, benefits on the dole or whatever. Um, there was the Enterprise Alliance scheme way back. I don't know if any of you remember <laughs> that. <laughs> Which she was the start of many sort of small businesses, or people putting out records or, you know, setting up record companies. Or um, I was involved in a scheme called Fuse, which Patricia Fleming, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she runs a, our, our own... Um, Patricia Fleming, her own organisation anyway, uh, but she ran a scheme called Fuse because she, she uh, managed to, it was kind of like the Enterprise Allowance Scheme and it allowed artists to, they were able to, um, they didn't have to sign on every week, um, but th it was within that kind of system and we, we got um, money for materials and stuff like that, but it was for a whole year. So it was as, you know, you were kind of foregoing that whole thing of having to fill in forms. Um, uh, and, but 
within a sort of creative setting. So um, yeah, that that was an interesting kind of model that she she kind of managed to wangle the the make the system work for artists, which I think is quite a, unique in a way. I don't don't know if anyone's ever managed to do that again. Um, and Rona, from <coughs> excuse me, the position of, of uh, voluntary arts, the point that Janie made around um, the the demographics uh, skewing towards folk who are older and, and have access to a pension, is that something you would see certainly within your networks? Or? Yeah, um, yes, I, th I, th I think there's a large number of, of groups where um, older people um, d they are in the majority, certainly in, in, in within our, our membership. And, um, you know, we'll speak up, speak up for them as great creative people doing great things in their community. But um, a big challenge that the, the groups that we work with have is bringing in new new me new members of the group and refreshing their organization and how they how they r r run them making connections with with uh, with younger people bringing them in certainly and i realize that the, the reasons for that will be substantial and, and varied but are those financial constraints a significant part of that for younger artists that they need to go elsewhere to secure some kind of income stream Yes, I think it's it's really about the profile of volunteering, ge volunteering generally. That there's points in your life when you're um, more able and willing to often volunteer than when you have a young family or a full-on full-on career. That's cer certainly the case, and and uh, that's I suppose it returns to my point about why funding to level the playing field between different areas is so important because you you often need um, to some, a level of financial security to fully contribute as a, vol a volunteer. Yeah, I, th I think you know, there's evidence to show that um, the sort of drop off within five years of art school, something like um, the people actually operating as artists after art school, within, you know, after five years, is, there's a drop off, I don't know if it's down to like 10% or something. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's, it's that waste of that, I mean, obviously, artists go on and operate in different sectors, and that's great because they contribute to society, bringing that kind of creativity with them into different spheres. But um, in a way, it's, it is a waste of that, all that, all that kind of input for it to just um, to not be sort of to, for people not to be able to kind of push on and have um, what you might consider to be successful careers. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it goes right back to, you know, um, uh, young people choosing subjects at school, you know, it's like if there's this kind of idea that the arts are not going to be a viable, viable occupation when you come out of school, you know, and your parents want you to do well in life, they're going to push you towards the sciences and becoming a doctor rather than the arts. And obviously people do do the arts because they want to, but I think, yeah, it's very problematic, that idea of, you know, I think... I'm going to be doing a workshop on Monday at the Glasgow School of Art to the graduating year. It's professional practice. Um, and it's that idea of having to go and speak to a room full of 20 or 30 young and uh, you know optimistic <laughs> arts graduates and give them a bit of harsh reality about the statistics. And you know, I think you know, graduating young, young graduates are I've maybe think they've got this career trajectory that will be, you know, <laughs> where in actual fact, you know, you know, 25 years out of art school, and I'm, you know, still struggling to get paid quite often. You know, so it's 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 a quite a tough career choice. But I would say that young, where young people often do get involved, is using the arts to highlight other issues of of concern that they're that, that are sent are central to them, and that, that that's where working with artists can be so powerful, whether it be dyslexia or autism or bringing issues to the fore and and finding self-expression. We see a lot of that again through our through our epic epic awards. Our last year winner was an autism project from Inverclyde, very disadvantaged yeah. community who do fantastic work, which I think they've even brought to the parliament to raise awareness of how to to um, be around young autistic people, so. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Kenneth Gibson, did you have a supplementary? Well, just a follow on from, from what Ross was saying, talking about, he was talking about uh, basic income. We were in Ayrshire College on Monday, and we spoke to a lot of uh, young people, and one of the, the, the issues that came up was the uh, diversity 
not necessarily in a good way between um, what happens in some uh, educational institutions with regard to artists and others. So, for example, we were told by a graduate of the Glasgow School of Art that no assistance whatsoever was provided in terms of helping them, uh, giving them um, any support or instruction or information or training in setting up a business or applying for grants. Uh, you know, or, or you know, or even filling in how to fill in tax returns and stuff like that. Whereas Ayrshire College did all these things. So, have you any concerns about that? And is that something you would like to see established across the board, so that when when young people are starting out, they they have a solid grounding um, in how to negotiate themselves uh, their lives through through. I think through there's the definitely system. a lot of scope for that. So. Uh, Scottish Arts Union, we've become affiliated to the STUC and um, we've got um, union learning funding now to to run sort of training programmes for artists. So again, this, this is your post-graduation, but I think the art schools could be, I mean, they do professional practice, but it's maybe a one day event. <laughs> And often at a time when a graduating, you know, graduating students are maybe n don't really see the point, or you know, maybe don't engage. But I think what you're talking about at Air College, that sounds to actually embed those kind of life skills, because obviously those kind of things like becoming self-employed and doing your own accounts is, you know, you you learn by experience, I suppose. But to actually be shown the steps of how to do it would be extremely beneficial. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, um, Annabel. Oh, thank you. Um, obviously, in the discussion we've had today and the discussion we had last week, um, and a point alluded to by Claire Baker, we look at um, you know all the the asks and you know the very wide range of asks and all very laudable. But then we look at the pot and we come back to the pot. And so, starting with. Um, the way things are structured at the moment, principally through Creative Scotland and the national companies, Creative Scotland. What we we need to do ultimately is to take a view on, is this the system that we should have going forward or should we have a different system? So starting with that, what would you see as a possible way forward? Keep it as it is, change it, overhaul it completely. What would you see as the way forward? Um... I, th I think, you know, you, you could make changes with Creative Scotland that would make it more accessible, um, that would make um, applying for funding a lot easier, maybe for smaller chunks of money. So, um, like I was saying, that each application doesn't seem like this kind of uphill struggle. Um, you could maybe do something that actually supports artists. Um, you know, there's other models like in Ireland where artists get um, a travel grants and, you know, sort of help to actually um, uh, exhibit abroad, things like that, that could be kind of happening. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but yeah, I mean, Cre I think Creative Scotland has its heart in the right place, but I just think the way it's maybe, um, the way money is being um, dished out a lot of people feel is quite inaccessible and and problematic. I don't know if you'd like yes, to add to yes. that. Yes, I, th I think the key the key for us is about I suppose transparency and a proportion proportionality, and it does feel for for the groups that we w work with and and for ourselves as a very small national development agency. I mean, we we are regularly funded and we re receive 390,000 for the three year cycle but that leaves us a very small organisation you the the re reporting and re and uh, application requirements are 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 very heavy so and it, it i realize the the pot is is very tight and there's hard decisions to be made but at at the moment i think the the proportion of budget that goes to small grants funding um, through Creative Scotland is half a million pounds a year to, to the Awards for All scheme, which we're very glad they came back into after being out for, for, for a while. But that, that seems quite quite small to support volunt um, community activity all over all over Scot over Scotland. And and as I say, it's it's 
very daunting to to apply for the open fund, which is so competitive and, and so hard. So, so I think, like all organisations, they can look at, at mm. dividing um, how they use the use the money that they have. We do benefit a lot from the funding plus, I suppose, that Creative Scotland offer, which is the the, so, um, the professional support, the networking opportunities, there's access to facilities. Creative Scotland have helped us revi re um, revise our uh, cash for culture um, in booklet and information for voluntary groups to, to let, make them aware of all the funding sources, and, and that's been a great help. So I think as um, emphasis on the things that the national agency can add beyond funding is equally important. Okay, um, so it seems it's two key themes coming across as far as working and adapting the existing structures concerned so that the the budget for small grants is is about half a million you said which seems um, a very very small percentage of their budget as a whole and also the point that Janie made in particular about the uh, excessive time it takes mm. to actually apply for this bit of funding which is a very small percentage of Creative Scotland's <laughs> budget they're going yes. on uh -huh. the data that's gathered and so on. And I mean, one of the issues, and other colleagues may have other comments to make about uh, this uh, theme, but one of the issues that uh, we discussed last week at some length was the issue of peer review uh, in, in an effort to try to get through this uh, particular uh, challenge of uh, you know, excessive uh, requirements in terms of uh, information needed to even make an application for funding and so forth, um, what would your views be yeah, I mean, on I think in the past, um, Creative Scotland or Scottish Arts Council, I think it was previously, um, the involved artists at more, I think, at the, the stage of um, reviewing applications. And it seemed to be that artists were more involved then rather than it being just this kind of... Um, sort of the, the arts admin side um, and yeah the people applying are more um, there's more of a divide I would say rather than a, something like a peer review system would seem more accessible um, but yeah I think also, there's also things that they could change where you know rather than um, individuals and artists competing with organisations because it feels like that's you're competing with a pot of money with you know Organisations are also going for the same kind of pot of funding and individuals obviously don't have the resources that an organisation does. They might not have the experience or a, a paid fundraiser. Um, so individuals, I think, always feel, to, well, from my point of view anyway, it seems that they're a, a less of an advantage when they are kind of going for for that kind of thing. Um, and, and also maybe um, where it's split up more into, you know, you know, younger artists or recent, recently graduated artists rather than, it feels like, you know, artists from all stages of their career are competing for the same kind of type of funding and, and it, it probably isn't taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it more, more intimidating for younger artists, I would think. Mm -hmm. In terms of... Uh, uh, one possible approach, which would be to seek to uh, have the provision of micro-funding, uh, you know, grants at that level, um, would that be something that you would welcome? Bearing in mind that we would have to, or a, a system would have to be devised such that you balanced the light touch inherent in such an approach, but nonetheless with some checks and balance. Um, the, the local authority funding that we mentioned earlier, where, you know, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, um, different areas do have these kind of spot, small pots of money. And I think it's it's that thing that actually by supporting artists, even with small amounts of money, can really kind of benefit um, greatly to do with kudos, but also the support, the backup, everything sort of around that as well. It's not just the money, it's actually getting that kind of support. Uh, that can all help. Um, so, yeah, that idea of, of, and I suppose working on a local area rather than this sort of more centralised organisation so um, local authorities could actually you know um, be doing obviously doing things that are for their local area with all the sort of benefits that that entails. Yes I, I, I agree that um, micro grants I think are best delivered at the hyper local or the local or the 
the network level where there's a close connection between the funder and the, the, the people who are, who are applying so that the trust is high and the monitoring is, is light and it's, it's all about getting the money out and, thing, and things happening and accepting, I suppose, a, a greater level of risk because you're closer to the, the people getting it. I think there's very good examples of that. And from the Paisley um, City of Culture bid, there was a, a micro grants given, and and I think you're still seeing the benefit of the groups that were supported through that through that process. They're ca they're carrying. On. So you seem quite enthusiastic with that notion. As long as well, you anticipate that for it to really work. Uh, the, the local connection would be key and we should have a look at yes. past All our precedents. focus on place-based working mm -hmm. would seem to provide really fertile ground for that mm -hmm. to be part of that to be part of that picture, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes let's pull come. on to Annabel Ewing's points. There has... Um, been some representation made that when it comes to Creative Scotland funding, there are some organisations that will get funded. Some of the big, um, the venues, Royal Lyceum, Traverse. So they're all going into the same bidding, but we all know who's going to get funded in some ways when it comes to the bigger organisations. Do you think they should be, there's been suggestions that they should be taken out of the system, that um, the, there's too much of a national significance, so we should make more divisions between ones that will get funded and other organisations. Another thing that I thought when Annabel was asking the question is around geographic spread um, and whether the micro grants would help with that, because that's been a criticism of Creative Scotland. Um, I don't know where the reasons for it lie, but there's been an inability of them to reach all areas of Scotland with their funding. It tends to be focused in certain areas. Um, do you have any views on that? And that's still a question, I suppose, around how do we spend the current pot rather than how do we increase it? Um, we know from our survey that actually um, we're quite unusual um, in that um, our members are spread geographically throughout the whole of Scotland. So obviously there are you know, pockets, very dense pockets in Glasgow, Edinburgh and the cities, but we do have members throughout the whole of every region in Scotland. So um, yeah, um, I think any kind of funding like that can, can really benefit people, especially um, people living in sort of the more re remote locations. Um, so, sorry, what was the question you're asking again, so Claire? The, the, the major institutions, I suppose, oh, being right. taken out yeah, of the so RFO right. round, it um, rather, and yeah, being I mean, dealt not, with separately. Yeah. It's, it's that, like, the Lyceum and yeah. the Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's the, the sort of, you know, the national companies already so the, yeah the, it's there's there's certain organizations that are very similar to these national companies they're almost like institutions in themselves and again it's the, the idea of different organizations having to compete for for pots of funding it's, it, i think it's a really kind of harsh system and again that idea of they're competing for like three years funding at a time and you know how can any organization plan ahead when they're only getting funding for three years at a time. I mean, it's not, it's just not very practical. And, and it, 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 yeah, again, it adds this kind of precariousness to the very, the whole sector. I mean, I, I suppose I see that the art, the art sector as this kind of stretched elastic band and things are pinging. So at the moment we've got Stills Gallery has run into, in Edinburgh here has run into trouble with the, the City Council raising the rents. It's put that gallery under threat. You know, we had Inverleith um, dropped out, although it's been reinstated kind of in a different way. Um, but yeah, in a way, it, it seems to be quite easy to close art galleries. It's not, you know, people aren't really going to take to the streets and complain as if you were going to you know, like they would with it if it was a hospital. But again, it, it's 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 part of you know the a cultural you know what we've got in Scotland, which is a really strong culture <laughs> in the arts. Something that we should be proud of. Thanks, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, just following on from the from the question regarding the geographic spread, um, if the the larger organisations were then taken out uh, of the of that particular. Uh, round uh, and they were considered in a separate way. Uh, potentially that could then skew uh, the aspect of more money going towards the cities as compared to the towns and the rural communities across the country. I mean, would that be a fair assumption? It's all about how the overall pot would be 
divided, is, isn't it? And who's in, who's judged to be in those national institutions and who's judged to be out of it? That would be a difficult um, thing, difficult issues to resolve. But I think um, it, it, I think what we're pointing to is how hard it is that, uh, to have apples and pears compare, mm. um, competing in the, in, uh, in the same process mm -hmm. when they're very different organisations and structures, and mm -hmm. that does disadvantage, I think, mm -hmm. both individual artists and community-led organisations. I mean, there's a lot of organisations that are maybe city-based, but they do a lot of work mm -hmm. elsewhere, or out, you know, outreach, or, or artists come to the cities to, to use them. So, you know, or like, uh, did you mention the Lyceum Theatre there? Um, so yeah, but who you know, touring exhibitions, all the um, touring theatre productions go throughout the whole of Scotland. So yeah, just because you're you're funding something that's city based doesn't necessarily mean that the the their influence is just in that one place. So okay. yeah. Um, a few moments ago, you spoke about the issue of the micro funding. Um, the, I would assume that uh, the majority of artists, when they when they graduate, uh, they were set up as a as a small business. Would that would that be a fair assumption? I don't know if they set up necessarily as small businesses. I mean, a lot of crafts, um, you know, makers obviously do set up as maybe as small businesses. But generally, like myself, I, I'm a sole trader, so yeah, I don't see myself as a as a small business as such. But um, you know, I'm self-employed, um, and I know a lot of artists who who are so. Yeah, um. but uh, I'm just thinking, just in terms of this, um, uh, would, you, would you then be entitled to apply to Business Gateway for uh, for some funding to actually assist you to uh, to do what you need to do? Yeah, I think when, when I set up as self-employed, it was quite a long time ago, and there was no <laughs> funding. <laughs> I don't know what the situation is now, but yeah, I, I'm not sure if there is any funding out there. I mean, it'd be worth probably investigating. Yes. But I, I noticed in some of the ev evidence that there was looking at the potential for community interest companies and, and so on as a and they ca they can be funded through the l lottery and, and others but i i know from other roles as sitting on the board of a of an individual artist who became a community interest company that that in itself was a huge amount of of, of work and effort which didn't necessarily play to her her artistic strengths and um and diverted her to some mm. extent from from her from her practice. That was a requirement of being an RFO funder. Mm. Um, uh, and yeah, it, it, uh, so I think it might be the right route for many people, but not not for everybody. Mm. I wouldn't I see mean, that. I, as a I think there's there's also things like the apprenticeship schemes yeah. that you know could be kind of adapted, possibly mm. for helping like craft makers. Um, so these are things that are locally based, but. I don't know if they seem to be as quite kind of inflexible, but yeah, they're they're possibly something that that could be more prevalent or or you know kind of used to to help sole traders or you know small businesses, that like particularly the craft sector. I think. Regarding the business gateway, I was thinking about them uh, over and above um, the other kind of aspects of uh, of creative funding uh, as compared to something instead of. Um, and on the, the issue of the peer review, um, so this came up in the discussion on Monday uh, in Ayrshire as well. Um, how would you, well, bearing in mind the creative sector is so broad, it's not obviously solely about music or about art, uh, it's, it is so broad. How, how would you want a, a peer review operation to be established uh, uh, to allow that to have a, a fair and transparent process? Um, in order to actually allocate monies out? That's quite a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, you don't want sort of nepotism, you know, no. to be uh, uh, obvious. Um, but I, th I think that idea of kind of peer review is, is a good thing, particularly if you had something that was a kind of rolling thing, so people yeah. don't stay in a position for too long and seem to kind of hog or, you know, kind of dominate things. So if you did have a kind of rolling... Um, body of people that did peer sort of peer to peer review in type my, things. In, with another hat, I, I was previously worked for a, a, a lottery funder, and I think I think peer review um, will work if it's open and transparent and flexible and doesn't get uh, stuck. Right. It, and so people take their their turn, and they, there's an open process for for doing that rather than. Um, 
a, a closed one, and I, I think that could add a lot of value. And obviously, peers would be um, recompensed for for, mm. for doing that. So, would and gain their skills too, and, mm. and and a greater understanding of the assessment process, which might help um, with the very difficult decisions that will always have to be made. Help people understand the process. Mm. I think when grant making is very closed and. Mm. Um, uh, for a long time, that's when people uh, can be suspicious of what's, hap mm. what, what's happening. And my final question, just in terms of additional monies, um, at, and at the table that we were sitting at on Monday, uh, a suggestion uh, was, uh, was put to us all regarding uh, if somebody has uh, obtained some money from uh, Creative Scotland, uh, and they then went on, but for them, if they obtain money to assist them in uh, progressing with their career, then at some point in the future, if they become a big star, they become uh, very wealthy. And there was a suggestion that uh, could they or should they potentially put something back in to help others going forward? I think every star of the Scottish Arts Scheme gets hundreds of letters asking for support from voluntary groups that have come from the same area as they. I mean, I know because that's what we, you know, we, you do. You, you're, so if they could be compelled, so be it. I can't see what the system is, but I think I think they're well known. The people who, yeah. who who've who've made it and um, are often approached and probably often do support support the arts. But I, yeah. can you think of a... Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, some, an artist benevolent kind of fun <laughs> yeah. would be quite a nice idea. But I think, you know, yeah, I mean, sadly, I think in, in reality, it w the percentage that w the figures we're getting back that for people, you know, earning over 30 grand a year even is like really small numbers. So maybe three or four percent. So I think the trouble with uh, being an artist is that, you know, as I said previously, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a good negotiator. So um, you might on paper look like you're a really successful artist, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's translating into, you know, getting an artist fee or exhibition fees or, you know, actually money in the bank. So I think because of the precariousness of it, um, you know, it, it's maybe hard for artists to kind of be able to, to account for things like that. There's always that kind of precarity that you know you might you know not be flavor of the month anymore you might not be asked to exhibit or to be given residencies or your 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 career could take a nosedive so i guess it may contribute to them giving helping kind yeah rather than, than i mean cash I, th I think there's that, that like our project yeah. our in kind project highlighted that artists are giving a lot anyway and uh, you know artists at all levels um, so anecdotally, we we heard a lot, you know, back from artists who are relatively, you know, quite well known, or you assume are doing quite well. In actual fact, financially, they're they're, they're you know struggling or really not doing as well as you would have thought that they would be. So yeah, I think that kind of highlights that. Under Stuart, there's no doubt that. We're a creative nation and that continues and, and you've given very strong evidence of that today and how people can be really inspired by doing things and how they manage to do things. But at the end of the day, it's the strategies that are put in place uh, by local authority or by government or, or Creative Scotland. So do you think there's a distinctive role between the three of these, between Creative Scotland, uh, local government and the Scottish government to try and coordinate all of that? because you've touched on today that there have been some successes, but there doesn't seem to be the transparency, there doesn't seem to be the cooperation amongst them all to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there, obviously there, there is a certain amount of cooperation and talking to uh, going on, but I suppose, I, I, yeah, I keep going back to the fact that, you know, there's local authorities, Stirling, Moray, different places that have actually completely cut their arts budgets. And to me, that just seems crazy, you know? And, and, and I, I think, what about the people living in Moray? What do they think, you know? Um, it, it, it does impact, it's Im impacting children, it's impacting older people, people, you know, people who would normally get the chance to be involved in the arts. Um, so I, I suppose I see that as being really short-sighted. So yeah, I think it, the the, these organisations do need to talk to, to each other. Um. You've also mentioned today about ring fencing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, that, that may be a policy that should be reconsidered in some situations that there should be at least a minimum basic level 
uh, of, of resource put into local government or whatever it may be to make sure that that is contained. Uh, because, as I say, the, the, the opportunities are being missed. I mean, Ye yesterday I was down in London at an engaged uh, meeting um, and we were talking about um, the the Welsh branch mm. of Engage, Clyde Cymru, and um, it, uh, basically they, they've been involved with the, the cross-party group on culture in the Welsh government and it's arts and health. So it's like the art, rather than it being culture, which I suppose you think of maybe as slightly something on its own, mm -hmm. that idea of arts and health and how it is so kind of integrated into kind of well-being um, and, yeah, things like mental health or just health in general of, of people. Um, so it's just a slightly different way of looking at it. Coordinating all that, it, it gives you much more of a, a, a pathway, even a career, because at the moment what we're seeing in some of the, the arts, if you're, if you're in management or if you're in administration, your career is sound and secure to some extent. Yeah. But if you're an artist, that's not the case. Yeah. Uh, so you're losing the talent into different... because they're only trying to find a way to sustain their, 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 their lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, I think things like uh, the, the use of in, intern, you know, unpaid mm -hmm. interns and things like that, it's, it's, hopefully it's becoming less recently, but, um, you know, I think the impact of that is that it does kind of in, undermine actual jobs within the arts, which is something to be avoided. Thank you, Camille. Thank you very much. Jamie Green. Thank you, Vina. Good morning. Um, I have a number of quite diverse questions, if you'll bear with me. Um, one of the things we talked about at the session in Ayrshire was this striking a balance between providing funding for arts projects, small arts projects which are measurable and have measurable audiences versus the dilemma of funding something which is art for art's sake and allowing artists to just to simply be creative. Do you have any views on that? Um, I mean, I think in an ideal world there'd be funding for both. So I think that that idea of um, arts, um, arts, the arts encouraging participation so that people from diverse range of backgrounds actually take part, um, that is a really good thing. And it kind of helps to kind of demystify. So through Engage, that, that, that's an organisation who's working with gallery education, obviously, who are, who are trying to be this kind of interface between what might seem... Um, intellectually difficult or you know for people to kind of grasp and where when you actually get people into galleries young people or you know children or whoever into a gallery and actually engaging with the work and kind of demystifying it and then creating their own artworks in response or whatever and um, yeah there, all that kind of stuff can kind of happen um so yeah i suppose we need we need as a nation we need people who you know, with creative visions or, you know, to be able to develop that and create careers as practitioners. But we also need to encourage the general population to take more of an interest in the actual arts as well. And, you know, like we've been talking about already, that idea of the link with sort of health and well-being and how it can benefit everybody, not just somebody who thinks that they're an actual artist, professional artist. Yeah, that's very much the approach of volu voluntary arts about the t value of, of participation in 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 the in the arts as a um, a tool to create a well-being and social social connectedness, and which would presumably help build just as you're saying the political support mm. for for more funding for for the arts because people will un understand it, be less intimidated by by the arts in the galleries yeah. or the opera houses or whatever. I mean, I, th I think Creative Scotland is you know, helping to fund, you know, th from things like Scotland and Venice, mm -hmm. where, you know, we're, we're putting internationally renowned artists on the world stage, you know, it's highly commendable, but they're also funding organizations, organizations like Engage, who are encouraging, you know, gallery education to so the other end of the spectrum, encouraging, you know, young people and children into art galleries and to try and de demystify all that and to engage with it as well as... The uh, criticisms that I heard, uh, uh, certainly in, in my table, was that Creative Scotland turn up in local communities and put on events, um, whereas there are local groups who are maybe better placed to do some of this. So they understand their communities, they're more engaged with people and, and far more accessible, or deemed to be more accessible um, to people. And that maybe perhaps is a structural problem with Creative Scotland. The other feedback I got, which was interesting, and I 
be keen to hear your views, is that the panel felt that Creative Scotland was very good at big ticket items in supporting our national organisations, uh, you know, well-known organisations. Um, but there was a, a disagreement as to who should provide uh, or make local decision making. And at the moment, uh, some people think local authorities, who perhaps used to have uh, more resource and cultural officers, uh, other people felt keep it away from local authorities as much as you can. Um, how do you how do you think uh, Creative Scotland could change structurally to ensure that it does look after those big big tent events, but equally is able to administer a, a micro local level in terms of small funds? and dealing with very small projects at the community level? Um, it, it's, it'd be very hard to do that without the infrastructure there in the local authority at the local area to, to, to work with, um, which is the thing that we're pointing out is, is now lacking, I, I, I think. It's um, because I'm, I'm sure that there are approaches to work in partnership and there are mm. there are parts of Creative Scotland that are focused on it's the same part that we report to and work to that are focused on on working with local authorities and developing place-based place-based working and maybe that's the the, the criticism is about the place-based approach being under resourced or underdeveloped in in Creative Scotland but I, as I understand it that's something that they have been putting a bit mm. a bit more emphasis on obviously obviously um could do could do more but it's i think the point that we're making before about the three levels being joined up and some some greater definition of what adequate arts provision yeah. means at a local level and what the what a budget should be is an essential part of solving that problem mm -hmm. you... yeah um back in 2008 i was involved under the scottish arts council i was involved in a scheme that they ran called the partners residences and um i did a year-long residency based in falkirk at calendar house and that that was a really really great experience for myself and the other artists who I did, did the residency with. But it, it was a way of genuinely engaging with the community because we were there for a year and we had the sort of resources of Fal Falkirk Council who had obviously been funded through Creative, um, Scottish Arts Council in order to enable that to happen. Um, and I think it was, it, it was a really good example of, of that kind of localness working but with funding coming down from Creative Scotland. So, I mean, at, in Glasgow at the moment, they've announced um, a residence, an artist residence in every ward. I think it's their 10 yeah. or 20. Anyway, um, so that, that's a, a sort of new innovative kind of um, model that obviously Glasgow City Council has rolled out. And, you know, I think people are really interested to see how that works. So again, it's that idea of artists actually being embedded in communities and genuinely engaging and not just kind of parachuted in, which obviously is very important, you know. Um, and uh, I'll try and uh, keep, keep this brief because um, uh, there are two, two very separate questions. One is around how do you make the application process more accessible? Uh, we had some feedback that uh, the process is quite onerous for artists who are maybe not used to completing lengthy forms, I don't understand how they can answer the questions if they're not relevant to their type of art. Um, also, as we spoke of earlier, um, adversely affects those with dyslexia or autism or people who are not used to working in very complex online application environments um, or who rely on the skills of professional uh, applicants. And the other one is around whether you think art students should be given more business training uh, because it's apparent that many creative people are very good at what they do artistically but uh, when it comes to uh, setting up companies, filing accounts, tax returns, uh, writing business plans, raising funds in the private sector, uh, that's something they find more difficulty with and we don't give enough uh, focus on that type of training in the art school environment. Do you have any thoughts on either of those? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that there's a lot of work that could be done um, sort of helping young artists to, to, to gain skills in, like, business skills. And, yeah, it, it might seem kind of onerous to them at the time, but um, obviously they would, they would benefit from it. Um, 
So yeah, I think there's there's definitely scope for that, and 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 also for you know the application process being more accessible, and uh, I, it would make it more of a, a level playing field because I think that's one of the issues is that you know if if you're if you're articulate and good at writing, you're almost sort of at an advantage to people who find that kind of thing problematic. So it becomes less about um, what you're actually creating or making, and and how you are able to write about it, which I, I think is a, another kind of issue within the arts. Isn't it? That's, I think that's a separate issue, the sort of over-academicisation of, of, oh. of what's going on rather than sort of concentrating on actually what people are trying to create or make. I think facilitating really early conversations with some with mm. people um, so that people don't waste time if they're if they're not going to hit the, the mark of whether the outcomes mm. of that funding is. I, I know um, a two-stage process can be quite useful if there's a quick kind of triage of, and so the, that there's only those going through to the second more developed stage have got a much higher chance of being successful. That That's something we in the Big Lottery Fund used as a, as a way of um, trying to reduce the burden on applicants. Yeah. That he's spent most of his time filling forms in rather than being an artist. Mm. It seemed quite sad. Yeah, well, I think it's a bit of a frustration. Should, but you know, they you, you should be having understand. a conversation yeah. in that case to find out why you know what it is they they could be doing differently or what yeah. what it is about their work that doesn't meet the outcomes of that funder. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, and that ends our first session. Can I thank both our witnesses for coming? It was a very interesting session, and we'll now suspend briefly to have a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Um, I'd like to welcome our next panel of witnesses who are individual artists and creative freelancers. Uh, they are Katrina Holmes and Emma Jane Park uh, here at the Parliament and uh, we are going to uh, try to bring in Kirsten Gow uh, who is giving evidence via video conference from Dura. Uh, we're having a few technical issues at the Dura end um, but uh, Kirsten is just going to join us as soon as though they are resolved. Um, so thank you very much for coming to uh, give evidence to us today. Um, perhaps if I could ask um, an opening question, we're looking at fair pay for artists, um, but in order to um, deliver that, um, the, um, one of the things that has come through is um, we need to be able to uh, convince the general public and uh, what, what the purpose of arts funding is. And I wondered if you would like to reflect on uh, what you think the purpose of arts funding should be. Should it be artistic excellence uh, to support amateur arts, um, audience development, uh, genre support? What do you think the purpose should be? Personally, I think it's a really broad purpose uh -huh. and it needs to be a broad purpose. And I don't think any of those things are actually mutually exclusive. And I think that's part of the issue that I know I'm facing on a regular basis. So I have quite a broad practice and I'm asked to place my practice into silos. And at times if I'm working with a community practice that is seen as something other than artistic excellence. Um, and I think that's a huge problem. I think for me, the purpose of public funding in the arts is about believing in the arts and culture and believing in the contribution they make to a society. And I think it's about funding artists to do their job, which is to make art. And I think it's about funding a range of artists to make art, some who make art specifically, say, in an area of social justice, some who make art for art's sake. And I think there's a real lack at the minute. And the reason there's public confusion or sometimes lack of public support for the arts is because no one can tie down what the strategy is or what what the aim is in funding public art. And I say that because I'm from a family who I regularly have the potholes in the road argument. Um, you know, if there's a pothole in the road, why are we funding arts when we should be sorting the potholes in the road? And my family don't go to arts events. I'm kind of one of those anomalies where I didn't grow up around loads of arts and culture. Um, in, in the way that I now experience arts and culture. Um, and I see the benefits of those things, but the difficulty is my parents still don't understand what my job is. And I think that's about visibility, and I think it's really difficult to be visible when your life is spent having to sit in closed rooms, writing applications and securing funding instead of being out on the ground actually doing what you do and talking about what you do. Um, so for me, Currently, for the next 10 years, the role of publicly funding the arts should be to create more visibility about arts and culture and its place in society. And then I think only once that is in place, can you move on and discuss the role of publicly funding the arts. From your point of view, what would make things easier in the short term? In the short term, yeah. um, I think a little more faith in artists. Um, I, I can bring it back to money really quickly. Um, I know on a personal level and for my peers, having a, a very small but regular salary would make my life easier because I could then plan appropriately. Um, but I don't think it comes down to money. I think it comes down to resource and partnership and opportunity and lots of things that aren't just about throwing more money at the problem. You could throw loads of money at the arts tomorrow and it wouldn't fix the inherent issues that we face. Um, it would be about having the time to be able to get on and do my job. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people who've been around me when I'm doing my job witness this, that I'll sit in rooms like this and feel really uncomfortable, but I'll sit in them anyway. Um, and I'll sit and write applications. And I'm quite fortunate that over a number of years I've trained myself to do so. But my greatest impact is when I'm in a room with people doing the thing I do, whether that is in a rehearsal room at the Royal Lyceum working as a movement director and bringing a show together, or whether that's working in a prison reform unit with young men who don't think the arts have got anything to do with them. And it just looks like we're making cups of tea and having a doddle about, but actually by the end of it, we've really worked on a lot of interpersonal skills. We've worked on the benefits of having a creative output. Um, so for me, just the ability to get on and do my job would make the difference, which is either about having a salary and being able to just pay myself to do that so I don't have that worry, or 
having doors opened because quite a lot of the time I'd like to get on and do my job and you can't. A couple of projects I've run recently, um, very lucky because it was Year of the Young People, were absolutely supported. So they were free and there were three institutions I walked into and offered free arts projects for the young people in the area and people just weren't interested because it might disrupt their everyday life. And I think if we can't give it away, we've got a huge problem in terms of public buy-in and visibility for what we're doing. Thank you for that. That's, is that does that resonate with you, Katrina? Uh, yeah, it's quite, um, it's an interesting question for me because I work with, I, I have gained quite a bit of arts funding for projects I've worked on, but I also um, am involved in promoting a music and arts festival, which actually generates some of its own income. And a lot of the conversation at the moment around arts funding is, you know, diversify income streams, social enterprises, you've got to bring in your own income. And also people say, oh, well, if they're not, people aren't wanting to see it, why put it on? You know, if it's not selling tickets, why do we need it? And I think that's where arts funding comes in, um, because art, new art needs to be made, risks need to be taken, um, artists need to be able to experiment to forge a new ground. Um, you know, our, it, good arts sector and good artists is important for society and for our culture and for who we are and who we can be in the future and is the inspiration for, you know, design and business and lots of things that started with poor artists doing crazy work and later became the norm because that's what art is. So that's, so I think there's, so there's definitely the kind of experimental risky work that maybe audiences don't go and see and I think arts funding is really important for that because where else are they going to get funded from? Nowhere. But then there is the other point that it needs to benefit society, people need to be able to see that other people are enjoying it and people from all um, aspects of society as well, from all socioeconomic backgrounds and from all kind of diverse backgrounds. And so there's an argument that arts funding should also be helping to enable all parts of society to experience maybe more accessible art forms. So maybe like the music festival, Knocking Gorak, that I, um, that I promote. So for example, or children's theater or things that perhaps some people might not normally go to see, so arts funding should help to facilitate them going to see that. Um, yeah. Practical suggestions. In your submission, you've made a number of practical suggestions as to how you think funding could be adapted in order to, um, to make things easier uh, for artists and cultural freelancers. And you, you, you suggested, for example, um, could there be a formal way to recognise freelancers who have a track record uh, and have been proven to deliver? Um, do you want to expand on that? Uh, yeah, um, so, you know, obviously you get the regularly funded organisations, which are cultural organisations that do great work and have been doing it for a long time and are trusted to deliver that work. Um, but there's no sort of equivalent for individuals, whether they are individual artists or individual producing artists or produce or creative producers and there's a kind of whole area there but there's a lot of independent individuals working in the cultural sector that um, don't have any sort of long-term support or formal support in what they do so they exist sort of hand to mouth from project to project um, I mean there's an aspect of that that's kind of part of the arts you know you get new projects and that's kind of you work on a project then that's over but that means that in the in the difficult times you could go under because you're not essentially bringing anything in um having a child might be one of those difficult times for example when you can't kind of get out there and network and meet the people and meet the art other artists and also develop the ideas in your head to create the projects um, and, but you, you can't get out there and you also can't make an income so once you're out, out of the race you kind of lose momentum and you lose the contacts and you know for example I, I had a baby about three years ago and just before I sort of had her I had like three or four people coming to me going oh do you want to work on this project and I sort of said no to all of them three years later I'm like oh god they've gone now and I'm sort of starting a little bit again I, I mean I haven't lost everything but I'm kind of having to pick myself up again and, and get out there all over again um, and I'm determined to, to, to stay with what I do because I love it so much and I think it's really important but I think it would be quite easy to go hey I'm just going to get 
a kind of easier, maybe more straightforward job that doesn't involve so much risk. Thank you very much. I think that we have Kirsten, um, Kirsten Gow. Can you hear us, Kirsten? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hear you. That's great. Welcome, <laughs> and th thank you for coming. Pass on to Claire Baker now because we don't have a lot of time and we've already lost some time. So, um, Claire Baker. Okay. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I wonder if the panel would like to comment on. We had an earlier discussion about diversity within the arts, and Emma Jane uh, Park talked about. So you work as an artist as well as within prisons and kind of social sector. Um, we heard last week that kind of model of the artists working on their own work as well as working in other sectors and a suggestion that not all artists want to do that, that wasn't the solution, that maybe only suits some people. Um, it's kind of a mixed approach. And then maybe comment on diversity within, I know Emma Jane Park was with the Cross Party Group on Culture before, and you've talked about women's representation. We've also had representation from BME community around um, uh, difficulty in gaining funding. Um, and in the previous panel, we heard about older, well, the generation gap in art as well, about who can afford to participate as an artist. So I don't know if you have some comments on that and maybe how within Scotland we could try to address some of these issues. I think there's quite a few things in there to unpack. Um, the first being that I'm around a lot of artists that do different things. And I, the reason I have a community practice is because I'm genuinely driven to do that. And that is something that arguably I, I thrive when I'm doing. So it's massively part of my practice to have that broad practice. And I've been around a lot of artists who make unbelievable art, brilliant art, who, if they're then driven to work in these environments as a tick box exercise or because it's trendy um, to have community participation, you end up putting people off art really quickly because you've got the wrong person doing the job. Um, it's as simple as that. And I think we need to have a balance actually in terms of strategy where we can have art for art's sake because it has a huge impact. And I know I can speak as someone from a very working class background who didn't have access to any art of that sort that arguably my parents would say is weird. <laughs> Just people weirding about. Um, that is the thing I needed in my life. And it was an accident that I stumbled upon that. And it's unbelievable. And I think it's impossible as you were referring to Catriona, to sell tickets to things if people don't know it exists, which is why I come back to visibility. And I feel like you can't have diversity in the arts if you don't have everyone with access to all of these weird and wonderful things, whilst you have the right people in the job to deliver that. Um, so I think it's important that we don't put unfair pressure on artists to be something they're not. And that ties into lots of different conversations, down to application writing, down to all of the entrepreneurial skills that people somehow celebrate that I've had to learn that I'm not very good at, that cause me massive amounts of stress, um, deep-rooted mental health issues and concerns. My whole family know if I'm application writing because I'm a nightmare, because um, it's not actually what I'm programmed to do. I've just learned to do it. Um, and we're doing a disservice to the arts, I think, if we put people into positions where they're doing a job they're not cut out to do. Last week, the arts organisations, um, which are funded by Creative Scotland, because there's, there's a balance between management jobs within culture and actual artists, that there should be some capacity within those organisations to support artists who are writing applications and having to work on projects. I, I think that's a possibility, and I think some organisations do that very, very well. Um, I think to use the word organisation in terms of art organisations is a fallacy because there's a hierarchy of organisations. Organisations have different purposes and to ask them to then work at cross purposes seems foolish at best. Um, I think it's about people knowing what they do and doing it very well and then if they're doing it well, supporting them to do it more. Um, Imaginate is an organisation I would absolutely herald. They have a programme at the moment called Accelerator that I was fortunate to be part of where artists submitted a two-page document with their artistic idea, talking about the art, the thing that artists can do. Um, and then they invited four of those ideas and they sat with those artists and a couple of producers and wrote budgets with them, helped them to really look at the project and they funded two of those projects. Um, I wasn't one of the funded projects because what I wanted to do was far beyond the financial support they had and the best thing that happened to me was them saying, please don't scale down what you're doing to meet our, our resources because the art will suffer. And then they supported me to go in and get 
some form of funding to move forward with that project. Um, and I think organisations like that, if they could be supported to do more of those things, would be really useful. What isn't helpful is organisations feeling like they have to tick a box by supporting artists. And then I turn up as an artist and I know that no one really wants me there. There's not a lot of investment in me being there. Um, I've been given a room, a very small subsidy to be there. Um, that often in dance particularly, which is one of my key art forms, results in a lot of solo work being made. There's a massive kickback in terms of programming dance at the moment because a lot of it is solo work. The reason for that is a lot of residencies in which to develop your work come with a £500 a week bursary, which is one person's fee. So people then just make work on themselves, um, which I would argue doesn't make the best art either because if you can't see it, I'm not quite sure how you can judge the quality of it totally you need other people in a room. Um, so there's there's lots of thoughts about those things, but also acknowledging that some organisations just aren't cut out to do those things and it's not their aim, so I don't think we should force them to. But with that, I do feel that some organisations, when you talk about women's representation, particularly, I think there's a real struggle in terms of diversity, um, and I can only speak as a white woman from a working class background, where I hear a lot of people saying, yeah, women, women in theatre, we need, we need to gender balance these programmes. That chat's been happening for years, and I think for me a gender balance is actually quite straightforward. You just only programme between 45 and 50% male writers and male directors. You just, once you've hit your quota, you stop and you go and find the other ones. So I really don't know what the complexity is. When we fall into artists who work out with a gender binary, they face far greater issues, and that leads to some more complications because we've not provided enough support for those artists to have profiles yet. Um, so there's work to be done there. But in terms of women's representation, there are women clawing the door down. There are lists online of female writers and female directors. And I'm unsure as to why some of the regularly funded organisations are still struggling to meet that requirement and aren't being held to account for that. Do you know if Katrina or Kirsten want to comment on diversity issues or at all? Oh, we, I think we can't hear Kirsten. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, brilliant. Um, so I'd like to echo what Emma Jane was saying there about in terms of supporting artists to, to write applications. I, I do agree with what she's saying in terms of not everybody, not every artist wants to um, to, to be running workshops and um, it shouldn't be seen as that um, or participating in community arts and it shouldn't be seen as that is the only route to funding. Um, in terms of supporting people writing applications, artists, but also voluntary groups, I've worked with a lot of voluntary committees, for example, the Scottish Glass Society, um, who were a bunch of volunteers who had some really good ideas and had some really good potential, but didn't know the, the steps to access that um, the the next level of support and funding that could be available to them in order to to develop projects. So I've done quite a lot of work with them. So I think giving people access to um, uh, to specialists that can actually really help them write really good applications, but actually the stage before that as well in terms of tease out whether it is a project that requires an application, whether it's just a good idea that they could be doing in some other format or if it's a big project that they could um, that they could uh, benefit from some extra support on. Um, and I think that would, in terms of diversity, I think that would help the diversity of applications that comes into, um, into kind of funders um, because you're not then reliant on the, the people that are already making applications, that already have the skills and the knowledge to make the application. If the problem is there isn't enough diversity now, then what, what do you need in order to get that diversity? And I think you need to support the people which it doesn't come naturally to in terms of making those, um, uh, making those um, applications. And that can be people from kind of minority groups, but it can also be very small groups of volunteers um, and committees um, who are just doing something good, but with a small little bit of um, paid extra input from a specialist that can help them develop the project could go could go much further. I agree that's this whole invisible area of work that, that has to be done before an application for funding can be put in. And um, 
who does that work and, and how is that work being paid for? Um, it's, it's, I mean, as, as a producer or a sort of creative producer, I, I do a lot of that and it doesn't really ever get reimbursed. If you're lucky, you get the funding for the project and, you know, maybe you can try and factor in a small fee for the pre-work, but it's not an official thing, you know, it's not in the funding application. You can't write in a bit for the, bit, the work that you did beforehand. And that's even if you get it. If you don't get it, well, there you go. That's just invisible work done for nothing and, and that's it. So there's no kind of... And, and so the support in terms of financial and not just financial, but also support maybe in kind of workspace, provision of workspace, free workspaces, communal workspaces for freelancers, childcare, which I've already mentioned, things that would, you know, doesn't have to always necessarily be financial, though that is also great as well if there was a kind of low level basic amount of, of grant funding or something available for people who are writing applications regularly. Um, and I also agree that it would enable more people who don't really understand the language that, and the way that you need to develop a project before it's ready for funding because you know I mean I come across quite a lot of people that have great ideas but great ideas are you know the very first step in a long journey and there's a lot of skills necessary professional skills necessary before you even get to apply for funding and so if there was some way to support artists and producers in that bit and it would also help yeah um it would also help diversify applications because you wouldn't just get the, the pros, you'd get all sorts of other people that might not normally be able to do that kind of thing. I'd like to come back in there, if possible, because um, I think the two things that I'd also missing is the fact that we need to support the people that feel like they don't belong in the room, and that brings me back to visibility. I'm from a working class background, I go back to where I'm from, and regularly people say, you actually work as a dancer, like, shut up. And you know, and you're like, no, no, I genuinely, have done this for 12 years, and I see young people. I've recently started a programme in Dumfries and Galloway working with young people who think they may want to move into dance, and it's genuinely shocking to them. And me just being there on the ground, visible, like I said before, makes it possible to them that that is an option and an avenue. And I can't imagine how that feels if you're a person of colour, if you are a person with a visible disability who frequently sometimes can't get in the building, which is embarrassing in 2019, um, but feels like you don't belong in the room because you keep turning up to rooms where it looks like you don't belong there. And I think that's why we need to invest in a lot of artists from a variety of backgrounds and send them back out into their communities to go, you belong in these rooms, so come and be in these rooms. And that also leads into the comment of language. I'm absolutely against really, really knuckleheadedly against training people to understand the language because we talk about having to justify public funding and I just think if the artists don't understand the language required to secure public subsidy, how do my mum and dad sitting at home understand the language that artists are then using? Like, it needs stripped back so we're talking in plain English instead of dressing everything up in aspirations and jargon and nonsense and then we we cut out a whole bunch of training that isn't actually needed in the first place and just sometimes in a kind way makes people feel a little bit cleverer than they are which is an odd thing I think to want when art historically was a cultural need and genuinely for everyone. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you. You've talked about the lack of transparency when it comes to funding. Uh, now Strategies take place at Creative Scotland, strategies take place at the Scottish Government level, and we also have some strategies at, at uh, local authority level. How coordinated should they be? Because we've heard from various people already giving evidence that there's a lack of coordination, uh, and some councils have removed their creative uh, section completely, uh, and the cultural sections are, 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 are demised. Other people specifically try to support specific areas, whether it be drama, dance or community. Uh, but if there was some kind of ring fencing and if there was some kind of real coordination, what kind of impact would that make? I think, uh, obviously, local authorities are in a, an excellent position because they're close to the nub of the matter. So they, can, they know their regional audiences, they know the types of issues that might be in that region and, and hopefully they know the artists or producers or organisations that are delivering. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been able to have got 
funding from local authorities and, and it's been very, very useful. Um, I have found in my experience that the, the amounts have been relatively low but the reporting has been relatively high and I think that um, local authorities maybe have tendency possibly to be a bit more bureaucratic because that's the way that they work perhaps um, in councils and you know when you're doing that amount of reporting for a small amount of money it's kind of a question of is this really worth it so I, I, I would love and think it's so important that local authorities are able to offer funding but i think it's it's very important that they are aware of how much reporting you know i mean ridiculous amounts of financial monitoring for tiny amounts of grants and you're sitting there like splitting the pounds and the pennies and thinking you know um at the end of the day and it also comes again this comes back to trusted people that you're working with you know if you trust an organization or a producer or project manager to deliver this project you know you're not just going to let them go and not ask for some sort of reporting but to a degree you need to trust them to deliver that work um, and so definitely light on evaluation and reporting um, for smaller grants you and you can kind of look at that and um, depending on the size of the grant um, and i suppose um, you know national funders like creative scotland are a, a an advantage because they are can see the international and the national aspects and um, whilst they definitely shouldn't ignore regional um, needs um, they can kind of see the overview but I think communication between Creative Scotland or national funders and, and local authorities is is really important so that they are covering all of the strategic aims maybe local authorities might be more to do with you know audience participation and reaching new audiences and socioeconomic backgrounds maybe creative scotland might be more to do with risky art forms or but yeah i think it's a good idea for them to take aspects of the things that arts funding should do and make sure that everything's covered yeah i think communication oh, sorry do you want to come in you sure <laughs> um, I, was, I think communication at all sounds like a dream and the idea of coordinated strategies sounds brilliant um, I do have to question if there are strategies, um, quite genuinely, and I hate saying it because I really believe in public funding of the arts, but I've read a lot of strategy in the past five years and I'm frequently handed aspirational comments um, and lots of things that people aspire to, um, but things I know that if I wrote in a Creative Scotland application, my funding would absolutely be rejected because I am told a strategy must involve me telling you what I'm going to do in detail, how I'm going to do it and what the impact will be, even if it's something that's never been done before. Um, and I read a lot of strategy that is so broad and, and overwhelmingly aspirational that it means nothing. Um, and I would refer to, and I'm a recipient of this fund, really candidly, um, Creative Scotland's new strategic touring fund. I don't think the fund has a strategy. Um, I applied with a strategy for this project in Dumfries and Galloway, so I was very pleased to receive that. But I do wonder if we can really hone in on what a strategy is. And then I think it would be easier for people to coordinate. Because if I tell you I want to drink that glass of water and you agree you want, I, you want me to drink that glass of water, we can get on board and figure out how I'm going to do that um, and the best way to do that. Um, my fear when it comes to coordination is that more money will then be spent on conversations. And I think there's more talking than action quite often in these situations, um, which is worrying when I know that there are people who aren't being paid at the bottom of that. And the other thing is, I think with strategy that we need to look long term and short term. And I'll come back to the regularly funded organisations on that. Within the portfolio, there are organisations that aren't going to be rejected for funding. If, and I, I worked at the Royal Lyceum Theatre and I love it dearly. If you turn around tomorrow and say you're not going to fund the Lyceum, there's going to be public outcry, as we saw in the last round of funding. There are some organisations that are having to do this application every three years and do this reporting excessively all the time. And I wonder if they could spend the time on that with artists like myself or just have more budget to bring in artists to do their projects. Because they also have to, to cut budgets here and there and wherever they can. Um, and then there are smaller organisations that are just new to the RFO portfolio that are arguably less stable. Um, so I don't think there's great long-term strategy in place. And I think without a long-term strategy, your short-term strategy is pointless. And if you bring that back to people, as an artist, I'm only ever allowed to think in short-term strategy. I'm allowed to think project to project to project, no matter how much I join the dots. And if I join the dots too much, I'm told that I can't be funded again because I've already been funded 
to do that. And if I'm talking about building visibility for dance in Dumfries and Galloway, that's not happening in six months. That's not happening in three years. Like, <laughs> really brutally. And I, I worry that if there's coordination before there's actual strategy, we just end up with a lot of talk and money spent on cups of tea instead of stuff happening. In terms of um, going back to just Catriona's point there, um, I think that um, funding at a local authority area is extremely variable. Um, there are some local authorities out there that do it absolutely excellently. Um, there are other local authorities that, um, which is unsurprising given the range of pressures on local authorities these days, the cuts that they're being asked to make, you know, the, the general political background, um, the, um, that it's not a priority for them. And I actually would argue that in the vast majority of cases, we shouldn't be asking local authorities um, to be the kind of the guardians of art in, in their local area. Um, I live in Argyll and Butte. Um, we have a really diverse range of geographies here. I'm sitting on Jura today. We've got 230 people live on the island. Um, I was in a consultation on fuel poverty recently and they were trying to talk about kind of how to group, how to to, to make the data that comes through about the areas granular enough to understand whether national initiatives are working within all areas of Argyll and Butte. And people accept that Argyll and Butte as a whole isn't a, um, is, is a tricky beast to kind of cover because it covers such diverse areas. Um, people agree that maybe Mackie, Mid Argyll and Kintyre is still quite diverse. And somebody suggested breaking it down into housing association areas. That covers Isla, Jura and Colonsey. You would never group those islands together um, in any universe other than the fact that they sit together. We're very, very different in terms of um, economy, population, um, access to services and that kind of thing. So the difficulty is that you, that I think people often believe that the problem is solved and everything and that funding is truly local if you put it out to local authorities. But actually the geography of Scotland is much more diverse than that. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I would champion for example, um, which allowed somebody, uh, an arts facilitator, be facilitator based on an island at an ultra local level. So something that's not funded for Isla Jura Colony or Isla and Jura, but would be funded for Jura, for example, to say, I just want a little pot of money that, that I can then help other artists here. So they've almost ended up being a, um, a funder, um, you know, a funder from a funder. So they, they got funding from Creative Scotland um, and then they used that funding for various initiatives, which included um, some group training, um, some grants to allow people to access um, uh, professional development skills and, and you know, a whole, a whole range of um, stuff there. But it was crucial that it was ultra local because I've lived in big cities and I've lived in very small islands and um, it's very, um, it is very common for people to think, oh, well, this is how we should serve that small remote area because this is how all small remote areas should be served. And yet, um, actually, every everywhere has different needs and, and different opportunities. So I think, for me, local authority level is not granular. Granular, uh, granular enough. And my other argument would be that if you are claiming to be a national organisation and claiming to offer national coverage, you have to genuinely be national. Um, now, in a way, I kind of don't have a problem if you turn around and say, do you know what? Reaching all these islands is a bit difficult, so we're just going to call ourselves a mainland organisation. That's at least honest. But if you say you're a national organisation, then I, I think it's really important that you show that um, a funder or, um, or a funding stream shows that they are proactively trying to engage with outlying areas. Um, and that can be done through creating their own networks and creating their own engagement within communities. I don't think we should be relying on the back of kind of local authorities. 
strategy and initiative isn't working effectively. Uh, are you then able to tap into some of the new priorities about well-being or health and social or community that then gives you that opportunity to try and engage and get that money that you require for your community? Yeah, possibly. Um, but um, I work quite closely with community development workers over here. And it's just an extra day a week, I'm, I'm not kidding you here, of looking at what is relevant to you and what you can apply for. So there is extra work involved in that. And, and we all accept that, um, you know, that we don't have access to absolutely everything living in remote rural communities. However, there should then be some recognition that there is that extra work involved. And also it's, it's the lack of um, a joined up approach so as both of the other witnesses were talking about it's it's the kind of oh there's a little bit of funding here and a little bit of funding there and that's for that short term and that's for that and everybody has different priorities and you can end up with a pile of admin on your desk and have, have been working really hard for a really small amount of money and an example of this was I was recently offered some funding I applied for some some funding for projects that were supposed to be for the Argyle Islands and I applied with a, a large chunk of pro bono time I refuse to call it volunteer time it is professional services so it's pro bono time um, and was offered I think it was about 85 percent of the funding that we applied for which you know was about we were offered about 900 pounds for a for a 4,000 pound project and um, and the amount of work and admin that went into getting that and then the amount that they wanted back from us in terms of admin and the amount of hoops that we had to jump through for £900, it, it was just ridiculous. And we ended up turning it down because we said, you know, we want to go away and rethink this project and look at whether there's a better funder to be applying to for this. Um, so, yes, there are other opportunities out there, but they are not necessarily joined up. You have to please several people and have a bunch of admin. Give me a note time is tight, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, Ross Greer. Thank you. Convener. We've had some suggestions in the written evidence, but I think uh, one of them was uh, your submission, Catriona, uh, around uh, universal basic income and um, how it could potentially help support artists, particularly individual artists in Scotland. I was wondering if, um, Catriona, if you'd like to expand on what was in your written evidence and if the other witnesses would like to contribute on the idea of what role basic income might play, particularly now that we're heading towards four trials in Scotland. Heading towards what? Sorry, just said that last uh, Four trials. We've got four local authorities that will be trialling universal basic income in uh, the next couple of years. Oh, right, OK. Um, I, I don't remember mentioning universal basic income because I'm, I'm not really that knowledgeable about it, but um, I probably talked about um, having some kind of basic, uh, yeah, some basic income coming in um, to kind of for for freelancers to kind of support those those gaps um, in between projects or those development times either creative ideas wise or research wise or actually um, putting things down onto paper and and working them up. Um, I'm not sure. Again, like it would probably need to be people that have been are established in the sector that are kind of trusted these sort of RFI idea which is rather than regularly funded organizations I think I said regularly funded individuals um, so kind of I guess it would be recognizing people with a proven track record you know over a number of years who have who have successfully obtained funding on many occasions um, I, I've also um, been aware quite a lot you know with with Creative Scotland when I've been successful getting funding that you kind of you kind of get the money and then they kind of they kind of go which on, on some levels is great because you you don't want people like interfering with you delivering the creative project but sometimes I, I kind of when I've done, come to my evaluation I thought I have sort of wondered who's reading it and and what they're doing with the information and whether that information is is coming back to me will that reflect on me I mean I hope it will because usually you know I take a bit of time over my evaluations because I feel really proud usually of the project usually but um yeah I do wonder like how is that coming back to me and and what how am I known in in the 
in the cultural sector or by, by the funders. I mean, because, you know, you do get... Because I've also worked on a funding side. I've also given out grants, the new arts sponsorship grants, when I work with arts and business Scotland. And I remember that, you know, when, you, when an application came in from somebody that you knew who had been working in the cultural sector for a long time, you... You still read it, you still assessed it, of course, but you, there was a certain amount of uh, reassurance that you felt and it was much more likely to go through. That's just the facts. And Because when I first started doing it and I was less au fait with the cultural sector, I was like, oh, why, are they, why is that one getting through easier than that one? And it was because that person was a trusted person that had been working in the cultural sector and delivering projects for a while. Um, and, yeah, the, the newbies maybe have to kind of build up that trust after a while. Um, so yeah, but coming back to your original point, like if, if you can find a way to kind of recognise and trust certain individuals maybe that have worked in the cultural sector for a long time, then perhaps there's an argument for a basic, I mean very basic. I, I was watching the, the one that you did on the 30th of May um, and I think it was Harry Josephine was talking about how um, the doll used to support lots of artists and that was how many artists in the 80s um, got started was because there was... Social security for them, um, you know, and it was it was unrecognised and it was a small amount, but it made that difference. So yeah, I think there's a case for it. Yes. So just before the others come in on that, um, on your point around um, perhaps the the administration of that being about recognised individuals, folk who, who have delivered, is there a tension then between that and what we've just discussed around diversity, that the sector isn't nearly as diverse as it, as it should be, so that the trusted individuals skew towards you know, older, white, privileged men, folk, folk who've consistently got funding? Yeah, I think there is an issue with that, and, and it, has to be, it has to be looked at and it has to be balanced up, because um, whenever you, as a funder, having sat in a funder's shoes as well, whenever you give money to a person, there is a certain amount of trust. We don't, like, when new things come in, we didn't know who that person was from Adam. So we would read what they'd said, we would look at whatever we could find on them, we would try and find as much as we could. But at the end of the day, you hand over a lump sum of money, it's public money, you don't know if that's going to come back or if that's going to be delivered. So there has to, but there is a certain amount of risk in it, um, but you have to be able to to award it to new new people that haven't got it. So I guess you may be looking at two approaches there, you know, one is, one is kind of recognising people that have worked four years in the sector, at, you know, back-breaking point to get to that point. And, and they're not all white, middle-class, old, privileged men. I mean, I'd say me and Emma Jane and are, are examples of those. And, um, so they're not all, but I would agree that a lot of them might be. Um, yeah, and then the other approach would be how to diversify, how to support people that can't speak this funding language um, and how to even if it's you know starting off with smaller grants for for newer people and and then working up big as as the delivery and the trust grows, I don't have a, an easy answer, but I, no, it definitely needs to be looked at. I agree. Thanks. I think. Say um, I'm a. Where you go? Um, I'm a long-term supporter of uh, the idea of a universal basic income. I have got a slightly different take on it to the take that Katrina uh, has. Um, one of the I've spoken to quite a few people about where funding would have helped them in their um, creative career um, over the last few days. Um, and one of the biggest gaps is the move between being a student and being an established artist. Um, often, I certainly know from um, from my time in college that actually it allowed me to take risks. It allowed me to spend time investing in my art, and then all of a sudden that stopped and I'm like oh okay it's not like I have an accountancy kind of qualification now and I can just try and get a job as an accountant I pretty much have to look as a glass maker of how to um how to actually now work for myself so having a universal basic income takes a little bit of the pressure um off um I'm off people having to switch from the thing that they have trained in and have spent a lot of time investing time and effort in um, to the kind of now I need to make money in order to pay my rent and eat and also then fund additional opportunities like submitting to an exhibition or attending an event or getting further training. So I definitely feel that that actually kind of a, a universal basic income model um, for people that are just starting out would help 
um, plug that gap. Um, I also think I work very closely with a lot of people that work in uh, arts and voluntary organisations um, and do a lot of pro bono work on top of kind of the paid work that they get paid to do. Um, and actually, that's it's great that they do that and that they have passion, but, but that leads to burnout. And actually, if there was the ability to say, um, you know, you could maybe work in your paid job one day less a week, and that would give you a little bit more headspace to allow you to have a life and do more pro bono work, then actually I think you would find that there would be more... Um, uh, more engagement, it could lead to much more diversity in terms of the the people that were involved in um, in arts and community projects and and working as working as artists themselves. Um, I think there is something to learn from the French example of um, if you can show that you are. I don't know a huge amounts about it, but you know if you can show that you're making a concerted effort to. Um, to work as an artist or a practitioner or a creative um, freelancer, um, then there should be some kind of support that helps you to do that in order to make that sustainable. I would echo everything everyone else has said, funnily enough. Um, I, think, I think it would support artists. I think that's really clear, um, and particularly in terms of well-being, because most of the freelance artists who are on the ground making things happen, I know, are absolutely falling apart. <laughs> um, I'm permanently exhausted, um, largely because I'm working too much. Last month I worked on some very worthwhile projects and I'll have been doing about 13 and a half hours a day. It averaged out because I do measure the hours I do now um, and I'll have made at best £1,600 after all other costs are taken into account and that's not including the pro bono work that I did to enable those projects to happen. Um, it's really unhealthy. But I also think it would support artists to then buy tickets and support other art. A lot of the time I'm having to scab a ticket from a friend <laughs> instead of reinvesting in the sector because I don't have enough money to do that. And I think it would support audiences because one of the big issues I see, particularly with working class audiences, is people don't have the time or money to consume art. And so if we're not making art that people can get to, I don't know why we're making it. Um, so freeing up people's time would be a brilliant thing and also people's headspace to really engage with things. Um, I think with that, it could possibly free up other resources. We're talking a lot about money, but there's a lot of stuff that we could talk about that doesn't have to be about money. Rural touring. If you can get rural communities to invest in art, there is free accommodation for the entire touring group because people just want to hang out with artists. And I think that would happen everywhere. But right now, there are a lot of people who are having to subsidise their life by renting a room. And actually, you would save a lot of money <laughs> if you weren't having to pay costs in a lot of areas. Try making work in Aberdeen. You spend more money on hotel rooms than you do on artists, really factually, unless you're willing to work at the weekends or make work at the weekends when the prices go down, which is all very odd. Um, and I think it would add to quality. So there's a thing in Sweden called the Swedish Dancers Alliance, and I think it exists in multiple art forms. And it's like a universal basic income that dancers can receive if they're not employed at that moment in time, which means in the periods that they're not employed, they can be training and making sure that they're keeping on top of their craft. One of the biggest issues I face is that when I'm not doing the thing and getting better at doing the thing, I'm doing something totally different. And then I always... I'm really quite nervous stepping back into a room because I wonder if I've forgotten how to do it. And I'm physically not on top of my game because I've been spending hours doing other things. And I think if the quality of art improves, engagement with art will improve. It seems like a no-brainer. Although with that, coming back to diversity, I think we would then need to look massively at who's assessing quality. I think there are huge gaps in diversity in the arts, and I think that's because the decision makers don't necessarily understand the lived experience of those artists and the people that they're making art for. Um, there's multiple things I could refer to here. There have been a series of reviews of some of the events at Take Me Somewhere Festival, where white middle-class reviewers have been reviewing work by artists of colour, and it seems quite heavily that they've missed the boat, and then given it low star ratings, and that can really affect something. Um, or in my own personal experience, I worked on Twelfth Night at the Royal Lyceum, and nine out of ten of our reviews were reviews by middle-class white men who didn't understand the need to gender swap one of the roles in the production. And as a young, quite, um, 
quite bolshy women, maybe, <laughs> is, a, is a word I would use. Seeing a woman play Lady Toby Belch was the thing I wish I'd seen as a child, because it gave me permission to be lots of things, and there was only one female reviewer cottoned on to the importance of those things. So if you're wanting to look at universal basic income and support and diversity, we need to then support diversity in all the wraparound stuff so that we don't end up with the people making the decisions and the people assessing the quality and the impact that has on quality making decisions where they don't have all of the information. Before I move on, we're very, very tight for time. So can I ask the um, questions and answers, if we could be as concise as possible? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. I'll be quite concise. We've talked a lot about uh, diversity, and there are a number of aspects to that. And one of the aspects is, of course, the genres uh, in the artistic world. I mean, today we've creative production, uh, dance and glass making. Some of the people who've given us submissions have expressed concerns that there's not an equitable uh, distribution of funding uh, uh, across the different genres. How do you feel about that? Do you feel there's a bias towards certain types of funding? Or do you feel that, that, that this is um, well balanced? And if it's not balanced, how would you actually resolve this matter? Should there, for example, be ring fencing for specific genres, if that's possible? Or um, how, how would you actually, it, should it be done in quality? How would you um, resolve that conundrum? If indeed exists, yeah, yeah. I feel like I, you know, Creative Scotland has heads of the of the different arts departments. I mean, I'm kind of a bit torn on this because I I can see why um, there's there's a sort of feeling that everything in one big open fund is is too much, and and that's not just about art forms. That's also about sizes of organisations, and is it artists or is it networking organisations? But I also I also quite I I'm quite in favour of the kind of breaking down of art silos a bit um, because it, I think it gives it. You know, I work well. I because I promote a multi arts festival. I suppose it's particularly relevant to me because there are certain things about that multi arts festival that I don't really. I'm aware that they're not really going to fit into any of the kind of departments in Creative Scotland because it's not music and art. It's music and art, or it's something that doesn't fit neatly into any one of those. So, from my my point of view, is is I'm probably I I, I quite like the mixing of silos. Although I I understand perhaps in certain art forms maybe there's concern that more is going to one than another. I think it's really complicated. I just think there's more of some stuff than others, and that's historic, and we would need to look at that history. Text-based performance is arguably more accessible than some other performance forms, um, but that's because of the way text is taught in school and the way we're taught to engage with text is something that's a bit more solid. So maybe there's a question there. And then I think there are some things that can't exist as much as others. This was one of the questions of the Strategic Turing Fund, where it was suggested that to make an application, you should have a minimum of 12 venues um, to which you think you would tour the work. But for an aerial artist, that's not possible because there's not necessarily 12 venues where you can put an aerial rig to tour the work. So I think it, it takes a little bit of sitting back. And that is where I would hope a national funder could step in and go, we've looked at what exists and we've looked at what we want to exist more so we're going to direct some funding in that way without letting other things slip past i i would agree with looking the national funder looking at what exists and what what else could exist i think that there's maybe an opportunity to take a health check and and look across the country and say you know how do we feel that um uh about the provision of theater versus the provision of of the visual arts versus the provision of more craft-based arts like ceramics and glass. And I think really in order to answer that question, you need to do that. You need to do a bit of a health check and say, why are some areas thriving slightly more than other areas? Um, in terms of whether there should be maybe artists and genre sp specific organizations um, being the ones that are kind of looking after those genres, um, I think there can be positives to that. However, some areas will need more support in that than others because some areas more uh, traditionally, and I'm thinking of the Scottish Glass Society in particular, um, are very reliant on volunteers. And if you suddenly said, well, okay, actually we're going to let you look after um, the glass kind of you know, sector within Scotland, here's some money to go and do that we wouldn't necessarily have the skills to do that straight away. So I'm not anti kind of allowing specific genre based 
um, kind of support from specific organisations, but it needs to come with more than money. It also needs to come with kind of the backing for those organisations and the training and the support for those organisations. Thank you very much. Um, Jimmy Green. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, we're really, really short on time, so can I try something different and just ask you some yes-no questions? Because I think it would really help me, because I think there's a lot already been said. Um, but I have some specific questions, and I'll just fire them at you. Feel free to respond. Um, do you think that uh, application for funding has just become a bit of a box-ticking exercise? In other words, what's trendy? You know, if you say that we'll do something towards a certain audience because that's what's in this year, we're more likely to get money, uh, and therefore not really truly reflecting the value of the art in which the funding is required for. I don't think that's a yes/no question. <laughs> yeah. it's it would be. It would. At, at the base level, no, it hasn't. There's people who really want it to be more than that. At the top level, possibly yes. Right. Uh, yeah, my overall answer would be no. But uh, there is definitely, uh, you know, a bit of the zeitgeisty thing. You know, obviously, if it's something that's kind of in you kind of got a feeling it's more likely to be successful if you can kind of tap into that. But no, I think there's a lot of people that really care and really know about their art forms sitting in funders' seats, so no. I would agree with the other, the other witnesses. And that leads nicely into my next question, is we actually heard from some folk the other day at a session who said, basically, just lie on the forms because we need the money. And uh, the forms, are, are, the application processes are geared up and uh, often to to make you fail from the outset because you can't answer all the questions. You physically don't have the information to, or inherently creative people aren't always great at forecasting revenues or audience numbers, for example, for shows. So uh, how, you know, should, should the application process change, be less one size fits all and more tailored towards different art forms? Sometimes you have to be slightly creative with the truth because sometimes they're asking for information that you just don't have yet, especially when the project is in an early development stage and they're asking questions that you don't know because it hasn't happened, it's not got to that point yet, so you have to. Um, but uh, I think I mentioned in my submission, you know, I don't know, the two-stage process might help cut down on having to be so creative with the truth because you're, you're not being asked for so much information so early on in the process. And I would say that I think Creative Scotland are particularly good at you going back to them and going, this is what we predicted, and actually this information's changed. The difficulty lies in the fact that not many people know they have permission to do that. And that's where this feels like there's a lack of transparency, because once you're in, you're aware that you can go, I said we'd reach 100 people, and now we've moved on with the project, we've realised it's for an intimate, intimate audience of two, and you're told, feed that back, and that is absolutely fine. I would agree uh, that a two-stage application process would help. Um, I would never, I wouldn't say that I have been ever been creative with the truth on an application form. However, I think I've just got a different perspective on it that I recognise that I don't have a crystal ball any more than the next person does. No, it's not just that arts and creative people can't forecast revenue or audience numbers. Nobody can. So as long as there is a recognition that it is an estimate, then that's, I don't see that as being creative with the truth. I see that as, um, as actually just being as as honest as you can be. Okay, I, I appreciate your honesty. And um, uh, another comment was made to me uh, on Monday is that at the moment funding is dictating the art, not the other way around. Would you agree or disagree with that sentiment? Uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't. There are definitely challenges in the funding environment, but I don't. I don't think funding is no. I think there's a lot of integral people in, in the scene. I think it's integral people, but I would agree with that statement because we have a sector whereby the only people who have long-term employability opportunities work in administrative positions or positions of power or are funders. There's no such role for an artist. So that's going to be the way it goes mm. until that's, that balance is met. And I agree that basically if, if you're looking at the whole sway of funding that's available, not just looking at from one particular funder, then yeah, because I often see people going, oh, well, I'm going to put that project on the back burner until, oh, look, that fund's come up now. I could apply for that fund. That would be relevant for this project that I had the idea three years ago. It's ridiculous that you maybe have to wait that time in order for a specific project stream, uh, funding stream to come up. Um, but I know of instances that people have had to do that. So I would, I would, I would head towards the, yeah, the funding, um, the art fitting the funding rather than the other way around. That's the situation at the moment. 
And is that it? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Thank you. All right. No, that's fine. I'm going to get Annabelle in. Okay, <laughs> Annabelle. Oh, thank you. Just very, very briefly, uh, to thank you all uh, for coming today. And uh, it's great that we've got live from Jura and we've got Kirsten there. Um, just one very quick question. I could ask lots, but we really are running out of time. The timing, we've heard that it, it's very time intensive to make the application. How quickly do you tend to hear back? You know, what is the actual process from start to finish? Somebody said in the previous part it could take three weeks to actually make the application. How long do you, how long does it take? Under, but open project funding it is eight weeks for a grant for below £15,000. Eight weeks to hear back? Eight weeks from your application from being the application. accepted. Okay. Um, and 12 weeks for over that. The Turing Fund has a much quicker turnaround. The Turing Fund is fairly speedy, actually, compared to a okay. lot of things. Um, and with other funders, oh. it can be three months, six okay. months. Any other comments on that? Kirsten, do you? In terms of um, it took the, the Scottish Glass Society funding that I recently got funding for, it actually took two years to develop that, that application on pro bono and volunteer time. We were supposed to hear back within three months. I think the timescales were slightly longer than that. And the only additional comment I would have to that is that that's actually one of the gaps that could be addressed by microfunding with quicker turnaround times. Because, for example, I've been invited to attend something at the end of this month. I just got the invitation the other day. I need to find £250 from somewhere to cover a couple of nights accommodation plus all of my travel because that's additional cost for me. The chances of me finding a funding within that couple of weeks time scale that will help me cover that is pretty much minimal um, because there's nothing that will turn around in that time at the moment. Yeah, I've just said that um, I, I've never been able to develop a project in three weeks. I mean, it, it takes, it's not just, you know, getting quotes from people and putting numbers down. It's also talking to artists and developing ideas and like building a whole, like two years is sounds, you know, or, or a year for me, kind of six months to a year minimum to de actually develop a project. OK, so it's, it does sound that it's a very cumbersome process at the micro, if you like, end of, of activity. Uh, and a lot of time is wasted on bureaucracy, which uses exciting. resources. Yeah. It's also quite exciting because it's, it's, that's the creative process, you know, is that development of that project. It's just time. It is time. Involves time. Yeah. There's another comment with time, though, that timelines don't add up. Okay. So you're really struggling to ever get... All I wanted to do was get ahead of myself. And mm. unfortunately, in lots of ways, I was very ill and had to delay a project for almost a year and thought, finally, I'm a year ahead. I can plan the next one, and then we're on this, like, plain sailing. No, if you're too far ahead of yourself, your funding will be rejected because right. something more soon is a priority. So you can't ever get into a stable funding turnaround sure. where you can long-term plan, which, again, leads me back to strategy. You can't have one. And also, I would just like to say really quickly that um, the... I, it is cumbersome. It does take time to develop a project, but I don't want people to think that that's horrible. I love that part of the process. I love looking at the potential, working out how it could work, working out what impact it could have. That does take time, but there is a lack of support for that stage of the project at the moment. I, it, it's part of the job I love, but I don't really get paid for it very much. So, okay, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to stop there because we're almost at half past. Um, can I thank all three of you for coming to give evidence today? It's been very, very helpful to our inquiry and I shall now move into private session. <laughs>